so glad that you all are here. Welcome to the first Qual Lab of the semester. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I am sure people will keep popping in as we go. And I, you may or may not remember pre-COVID, we were all in person. I was just mentioning to Erin, we were in person and around a table and just really kind of diving into research and a little more informal, but uh, COVID, it's now online just to make sure everybody's safe and people can come and, and have access. So we're very glad you're here. So just, uh, Bakari will introduce our esteemed guest speaker in a minute. And uh, my name is Penny Pasquay. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a professor in educational studies, as well as the director of the Qual Lab, which is uh, one year old. So it's an exciting time for us. Um, Bakari will introduce himself in a second and I'll um, let him do that. Right now, I'm gonna quickly move to the uh, information about uh, housekeeping. And so please turn on your videos if possible. I know some of you are having lunch with other people and not always able to do that. That's totally fine. So really just, you know, what we'll just have, uh, you know, see how it goes. But of course, we'd love to see you if possible. We're going to be recording and the video will be available on the Qualab website now and in perpetuity. I know a number of faculty use it for their classes. And so um, you can find it there. And uh, closed caption, you can just pop that on if you need it. It should be available to all. Um, and then in terms of the outline and the format for this session, so I'm introducing you and welcoming you and thank you for your time. But in a second, Bakari will introduce our speaker and uh, then uh, she will chat for a little bit with us and share some amazing knowledge. And then we'll just have an informal conversation and, and talk with each other. And if that relates to your work or you have questions about it with a small group, we can just go there. So I'll, I'll certainly let Dr. Beaton uh, or run that section. We do have a number of Qual Lab lunches, so we'll share that at the end if there's time and we welcome you to all of them. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Bakari Lamumba. Thank you, Dr. Pasquay. My name is Bakari Lamumba, and I'm a graduate research assistant at the Qual Lab here at The Ohio State University. I'll be introducing our featured speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Aaron Beaton. Dr. Beaton is an assistant professor in the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University, where she studies and teaches how nonprofit organizations can be organized and managed as a mechanism for social change. Specifically, her research focuses on the ways in which the nonprofit sector and its organizations reflect, combat, and sometimes reproduce structural inequalities. She has published in journals such as the Journal of Management Studies, Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector Quarterly, the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, and Public Management Review. Her doctorate degree is from the University of Massachusetts Boston College of Management Program on Organizations and Social Change, where she was trained as a critical and qualitative leaning scholar. She also holds an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management and a Bachelor's of Journalism from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Please, without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Erin Beaton. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Bakari, and, and thanks for having me. Um, I am just going to share my screen here and um, jump in. So, I thought a lot about what would be most useful for me to cover today in my talk. Um, and in a fairly short period of time, what I think I'd like to do is actually twofold. I, um, first, I'm going to share my perspective on the critical qualitative landscape, which I think will be beneficial and generate some good discussion. But what I also wanna be able to do is to focus in and provide an example of what critical qualitative research can look like. Um, the field, it has a lot of abstract ideologies and traditions that, that um, sort of comprises it. So at least for me, I need a good example of how these traditions are put into practice before I can really sink in um, and really understand it. So about halfway through, I'll shift to the example of post-structural feminism and try to demonstrate what qualitative research in that area can look like. 
So before I do that, Bakari already gave an excellent introduction um, in, in my background, but before I start to talk about my view in the field, I think it's really important to be clear about what my sort of intellectual ancestry, if you will, is because what I'll present is necessarily influenced by where I've come from. So as Bakari shared, um, while my first degree was in journalism, the remainder of my education, my master's and doctoral work was in a business or in both business schools. My PhD from US Boston was in a program called Organizations and Social Change. And it's made up of a pretty diverse group of folks. Um, I was trained mainly by social sociologists um, and some organizational theorists. Um, but several of them had a pretty critical bent. Um, so for instance, one is a critical management scholar um, using a lot of labor process theory. Um, his favorite uh, uh, philosopher is Gramsci um, and um, someone else that was pretty influential in my program and training me um, identifies as a post-colonial feminist. So sort of a broad um, group of folks all coming from different places. So I, I got what I think is kind of a nice introduction to a lot of these critical perspectives. So from the start, I'm gonna share two citations with you because my view of this field is pretty strongly informed by these two texts. Um, and even, even after reading other perspectives, these are the ones that are most consistent with how I see the field. The first is Burrell and Morgan's book on sociological paradigms, and the second is Pushy Prasad's book on qualitative research tradition. tradition. So much of what I'm going to share, if you want to read more about it, um, these are the two books to kind of go to. So I'm going to start with um, an overview of the landscape focusing on paradigms. So in Burrell and Morgan's book, they give a framework for understanding research paradigms. They argue that there are two dimensions to consider. The first represents views about the nature of social science. It's essentially an onto epistemological spectrum. And on the left side is a subjective view of reality and truth with a little t. Um, and on the right is an objective view of reality and truth with a capital T. Um, and then the second dimension represents views about the nature of society. As scholars, should we be more concerned with how society is cohesive, well-regulated, and seek consensus? Or should we be concerned with existing social arrangements and attempt to overthrow or transcend the limitations of those arrangements? So when you put these two dimensions into effect, it creates four different paradigms. And qualitative research, I think it's important to point out, can be conducted using any of these four paradigms. So qualitative research falls into, into all of these um, buckets. The functionalist paradigm is also the positivist or some would say post-positivist paradigm. Qualitative research that attempts to establish causality fits in, into that sort of category. The interpretivist paradigm is what we think of traditionally in qualitative research, um, where phenomenology and ethnography sit. And then the top two paradigms around radical change are based primarily on Marx's work and are distinguished by his epistemological break. So the radical structuralist paradigm is drawn from a mature Marx post break um, and focuses on historical and materialist analyses. And then the radical humanist paradigm is where we're going to spend our time today. It's grounded in the young Marxist perspective. So when I think of critical perspectives, um, I really think of those in qualitative research. I'm really thinking about those coming from a radical humanist paradigm. So I think it's important to sort of establish that. So within the radical humanist paradigm, um, there's a broad intellectual landscape. Um, I've adapted much of Pushy Prasad's work to develop this sort of intellectual tree, but added some additional scholarship in. Um, so what we call the critical research tradition stem pr predominantly from Marx and includes the Frankfurt School critical theory with a capital T. Um, it also um, branches off to include critical race theory, radical feminism, and to some extent post-colonialism as well. And then I tend to think when I think of the critical traditions, I include the post traditions as well. Um, and uh, these traditions stem from anti enlightenment thinking by philosophers like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. 
These traditions include postmodernism, postcolonialism, poststructuralism, um, and from poststructuralism, queer theory. So this is clearly not an exhaustive list and leaves, leaves out some really important perspectives, but others could be mapped on. For example, Black feminist thought would be situated sort of at the intersection of critical race theory, feminism, and queer theory, since there's really strong links to, to all three of those traditions as well. Um, so all of these research traditions are grounded in similar assumptions of the world, namely or specifically this underlying radical humanist paradigm where we're focused on emancipation and changing social arrangements um, and see the world in a more subjective, um, plural way. So while there's these similar underlying assumptions, each of these traditions also have their own ideas about how empirical research should be conducted. And often the traditions are combined with one another or even with interpretivist traditions so that you get things like critical ethnography. Um, so what I'll say about um, working in these traditions is that what I've learned over time is that um, it's different than working in other qualitative research traditions. And that if I wanna learn a new form of interpretivist qualitative inquiry, like grounded theory, just as an example, it's pretty easy for me to find a text that tells me exactly what to do, when, and how. And maybe some qualitative researchers would disagree a bit about that. Um, but what I find is it's even less clear in these spaces that are more critical in nature. Um, and there's really a reason for that. Um, it's because working in the critical traditions is just as much, or really in my view, more about your underlying philosophical commitments than it is about the research techniques that you actually use. So you can't just say, in order to do this type of research, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you have to, it's actually just about what you're committed to um, in more of a philosophical sense. So you need to really understand the underlying philosophy, assumptions, and aims of that tradition of research before you jump into a project, um, because you're going to have to draw on those ideas to guide your methodological choices and not rely on a text that gives you a step-by-step -step process. And given that there's um, rarely a how-to manual for these methodologies, I thought it'd be useful then to share what one might look like to sort of illustrate the point. So I chose to focus on post-structural feminism because I'm working on a project in this space, so it was sort of top of mind. Um, so first, I'll briefly share a few points about feminism and post-structuralism separately, because as you saw in the sort of intellectual tree, they're, they're in different spaces and even born out of different intellectual traditions. So for those of you that are less familiar with feminist forms of inquiry, there's multiple strands of feminism and each has a different set of underlying assumptions about how to deal with sexism and male um, power. However, most of the strands use pretty common concepts to differentiate between sex and gender, to attend to sexuality, and they all aim to overthrow patriarchy. Key research practices in feminism um, are influenced by which strand of feminism you're working within, but most of them focus on giving voice to women and creating closeness with your research participants. So whereas if you're doing a positivist qualita qualitative inquiry, you might treat the people being researched as research subjects, or in the case of ethnography, the preferred term is often informants. Feminist theory treats these individuals as active participants in the generation of data and knowledge. And the goal then is to create a closeness with the participants. And there's even some, sometimes an underlying expectation or commitment from feminist scholars that you would continue to have or maintain a relationship with your research participants after the research project is over. And feminist researchers um, also uh, find it important to personalize their research account and use reflexivity. Um, reflexivity is now a concept that you, that's used on, in a lot of qualitative traditions or just an expectation um, in qualitative research, but its practice can be traced back in part to feminist research. Um, and ultimately, the goal of feminist research is to emancipate women from patriarchy. Um, so any methods really that aim to do that can be, can call themselves feminist. 
So looking at post-structuralism as a research tradition, then um, post-structuralism encompasses the work of several philosophers, including Foucault and Derrida. It was developed in response to structuralist and enlightenment thinking, and it's a pretty complex and dense set of literature. If you've ever tried to read Foucault, you know what I mean. Um, but at its core, post-structuralism recognizes that um, the power of language and discourse, but it also at the same time really questions language and problematizes it by showing its multiple meanings and interpretations. So as a qualitative research tradition, there are some key practices that include undermining one, one's own writing and interpretations and questioning what counts as knowledge. So Foucault offers two analytic strategies, archaeology and genealogy, which calls for questioning of how knowledge has been created over time and is historically contingent. And Derrida offers up his own um, analytic strategy of deconstruction, which is a close reading of texts. So if you put these two together, post-structural feminism combines these views of power, language, and discourse with gender, sexuality, and patriarchy. So briefly, what does that look like then? Um, the research project I've been working with um, is with a colleague, Megan lapierre Schloop, and we're looking at experiences of sexual harassment in both public and nonprofit organizations. The example I'll give today is in a public organization. And we've been conducting interviews with people who have, um, who've experienced sexual harassment. And one approach I'm taking with the data is a post-structural feminist analysis. So here, um, I share a template that I think is actually really useful for all qualitative researchers, especially when I'm drawing on more than one qualitative research tradition, which I find is quite common, at least in my work, whether it's interpretivist or critical or one of each. Um, I include either in the paper or in a reviewer letter, a table that shows how the research aligns with the traditions that I'm claiming to associate my work with. So here's one that demonstrates how I combine feminism and post-structuralism. The research question is feminist because it focuses on experiences with sexual harassment, which um, predominantly affects women. The research is designed by using interviews to give voice to women, and I focus on data production and meaning making along with participants. The interviews are feminist because they focus on an absence of power between the interviewer and interviewee. Um, and to draw on empathy. Um, whereas if you're doing maybe a more interpretivist or particularly positivist interview, it's very much about not entering into the interview process, right, and not biasing it. Um, here, there's, it's very much about creating connection, closeness, empathy. Um, the analysis um, is feminist because the one doing the analysis, me, is a feminist identified scholar, and it's done for the purposes of emancipation. The research question is also grounded in post-structuralist conceptions of power as being everywhere. And my analysis concentrates on one single interview so that I can really look closely at the language and inspect it. Um, I use deconstruction and then reconstruction as my primary method of analysis, which I'll explain here on this next slide. So deconstruction and reconstruction. Deconstruction, like I said, is just a really close reading of the text. Um, it's looking to interpret the meaning of language as plural and implicated in discourse. So I use strategies of dismantling dichotomies, examining silences in the interview transcript, um, which is interesting because for those of you doing qualitative research and transcribing interviews, you know, it's always tough with the punctuation, right? Like, do you use ellipses? or commas, or how do you really represent what someone's saying? So it's very important that this transcript was done very carefully because part of the process is not only looking at what's being said, but what al also what's not being said. And then looking at contradictions in the research participants' language. So the analysis is also intended to include a restory. I haven't um, shared that here, but um, part of the deconstruction process is a reconstruction where, in a feminist sense, um, we can recreate and rewrite a fictional version of this story that's emancipatory for the research participant. 
So I'm going to give just um, a, a quick example here about um, what deconstruction can look like in this sort of feminist way, and then we'll open it up to, to some discussion. One of our research participants was Liz. I've given her a pseudonym here, obviously, to protect her identity. Liz identifies as a woman and is highly educated. She works for the government. In her role, she supports several different Congress people, offering advice and expertise on policymaking. One of the congressmen regularly makes unwanted, unwanted comments about her appearance. One way to understand how power manifests in her experience of sexual harassment is to deconstruct the language that she used to tell her story. So here's how Liz tells her story. One day where we're getting ready for a committee, background. I for years had astigmatism. I went to the eye doctor, it was suddenly gone. I got to wear normal glasses and normal contacts. My doctor said, hey, why don't you try wearing your glasses one day a week just to give your eyes a break? I show up to work with new glasses one day. I'm sitting in a chair where I'm literally in the corner of the room. He's just standing over me telling me, oh, you're wearing glasses. I didn't know you wear glasses. I think women who wear glasses are so sexy. My wife wears glasses and she's just so beautiful. I'm like, I don't know what to say to this. Thank you, sir. So here Liz begins to tell her story but she almost immediately stops. She backs up to explain why she was wearing glasses to begin with. It's unclear why she feels like she needs to provide an explanation at all. It could be that she feels the need to defend herself, to explain the reason she was wearing glasses was mundane, having nothing to do with wanting this unwanted attention. It could be that she's giving the congressman an excuse that it was sort of abnormal that she was wearing glasses, so maybe he had a point there. Either way, it doesn't really matter why she was wearing glasses, there was really no good explanation for sexualizing someone in the workplace. One form of power from the literature is the power to keep issues off the agenda or out of the public eye. Liz's responses is, response to this situation is to feel internal discomfort and resistance, but doesn't feel safe confronting her harasser, so her needs are erased from the situation. Another way in which power can manifest is more structural in nature, the perpetuation of gendered norms. This comes up when the congressman brings up his wife. He seems to be trying to sanitize his comments by reminding everyone, perhaps including himself, that he's married. However, by implying he appreciates when Liz appears sexy, it suggests Liz should appear that way more often and perpetuates a gendered norm. What Liz does not say in her story is that the congressman probably isn't making similar comments about the appearance of men in the office. So Liz goes on to, in her story to explain, the solution from that has been not to wear glasses to work so no one can comment on them, which is ridiculous, but it solves the problem. That particular legislator has also consistently, will be talking on the phone about something and he'll say, I bet you look good today. That's come up a number of times. In fact, he called me three hours ago. I said, hello, Congressman, how are you? He said, oh, I'm good. You look good today. I'm on the phone, so I don't even know if he's here in the office or not. So Liz says her solution is to stop wearing glasses, which is a form of self-policing that Foucault describes as evidence of power. When we restrain our own actions based on social norms and expectations, it's a form of power. Liz contradicts herself though. Her solution is to stop wearing glasses, but that doesn't really solve the problem if the Congressman is making comments about her appearance, even when he can't see her. So um, hopefully you can sort of um, see here just in these two brief excerpts of the interview with Liz, there's so much latent meaning and po many possible interpretations to unpack. And there's also power written all over it. The goal of the de de this deconstruction is to elicit the many different meanings and, and forms of power. And then to use that analysis to write um, an emancipatory ending to Liz's story, a fictional story where she gets justice in this situation because she didn't in real life. Um, so I know I went through all of this fairly quickly, but I hope I gave some territory to spark some overlapping interests and prompt some good dis discussion, giving kind of the overarching view, at least mine, of what the critical qualitative space looks like, and then um, sort of illustrating what that can look like when you, when you bring a couple of those traditions together. Yay!
<laughs> Thank you. So I'll, I'll stop sharing here. Um, and yeah, open it up for discussion, questions. Um, Well, just want to start by thanking you, Dr. Beaton, for that riveting conversation about, of course, post-structural feminism, the quest for gender justice, and really highlighting and illuminating some of the issues, of course, that our female colleagues deal with in the workplace. So this is a very uh, provocative conversation that I hope we can have now, now in the question and answer section. So we will open it up to the rest of participants for question and answers, dealing with issues of power, hegemony, patriarchy, right, or even in this case, dealing with issues of sexual harassment in the workplace. I can go ahead. I've been trying to raise my hand, but I can't find the button. Um, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Super interesting. Thinking about how, like reading through the excerpts, how it triggered me, right? I was like, he did not say that. Oh my God. And I've experienced things like that. Um, I was wondering how you deal with um, the potential harm that recollecting all of these experiences and remembering these experiences can, can do. Um, and also the power just went out in my room. So I will be right back if you could hold for a second. This keeps, I don't know. I'm in Denny Hall. It keeps happening. I'll be right back. Oh no, I'm so sorry. Well, I, I know I want you to answer that, but I also want her to hear it. Do other people have things to add or questions while Michaela uh, steps away? I, Jill has her hand up. Please go right in. Hey, ahead. Jill. Hello. Thanks, Erin. I, I want you to join like one of our teams right now um, because like just showing how you approached just those two excerpts um, in the interviews was really interesting. And I'm thinking, okay, so what how do you approach something and say what are they not saying like what what is it about the text that triggers that for you because that's a technique i i'd love to employ yeah so <laughs> it's tough right this is my first time using deconstruction as as a method and so i've been reading a lot about it and reading examples of it and it's interesting doing it for an um, for publishing purposes as well, right? Because I'm also um, I'm going to target a journal that I think is going to be open to this, right? But it's still an academic audience, um, and so how can you analyze things that you don't even have real data on, right? Um, so there's um, there's been a few things that that. Uh, that I've done. One is like those ellipses in the interviews I think are really important where they stop and change direction about what they're saying. I try to look at that and say, why did they stop themselves? Um, and I think one thing that actually makes this deconstruction easier for me is that um, I can see myself saying these exact same things, right? Um, and I think it would be um, so I think I have an advantage in interpretation. Um, I think my interpretation is probably quite close to the way Liz might interpret um, her story. But I also had, um, I worked on these deconstructions with um, one of our PhD students who does a lot of work in um, sexual harassment and assault. And she it was interesting because she read and deconstructed it quite differently than I did, right? But that's one of the purposes of deconstruction is to not just show that there's one interpretation of what Liz says, um, that there are many of them, those interpretations. And um, perhaps you choose um, as a philosophical commitment to try to um, surface what Liz actually intended to mean, but in a post-structuralist sense, that's actually not the objective. The objective is more to surface all the potential meanings um, that could be underlying. So I think while I'm working right now on this paper all by myself, I'm glad that I had someone else to engage in that deconstruction with. And I've even considered um, reaching back out to this research participant and having her take a look at um, 
how I've deconstructed it, see if she has a different reading to add. I've also considered having some men read, you know, the what the interview says and do their own deconstruction. So I think when you're doing this method right, you're actually surfacing as many possible meanings and there is no wrong meaning necessarily. Um, but that's also tough because in, in an academic sense, you're looking to make a contribution and that's hard to do without like choosing a particular meaning or interpretation sometimes. That's all I've learned about it so far. That's all I know. <laughs> uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. There's some I mean, there's contribution is just pointing out the tensions, right? That there yeah. is this tension, that there is this unsaid story. And maybe exactly what it is doesn't matter as much as that it's there. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but reading some of the empirical papers where they, they do some of these deconstructions, um, I find it really useful to, and there's one in particular that I can send to you where they had some really nice strategies for going about it. This like pulling apart part dichotomies. Um, what does it mean to be man or a woman? Um, and so pulling out terms that are used in the language that are dichotomous and say like, how let's, you know, take apart that dichotomy and interpret it. So some of the strategies that they propose in deconstruction can be really useful and, and quite specific. Michaela, you're back. You have power. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think that your question, oh, it's such a good question. It's a tough one. Um, so I can answer it a few ways. Um, one is just to talk about- out. We just, we added somebody but in between, so might not have heard your original question. Yes, of oh, course. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so we were reading through the interview's um, transcript and they, she was describing some um, incidents of sexual harassment at the workplace. And I was debating on how it triggered me and I just had a very violent reaction to it. And I was wondering how we can deal with those reactions that inevitably um, come up in, in the interviews as well as they remember and recollect these harmful experiences and how we deal with that as a researcher um, when we, we absolutely don't want to do harm, but it inevitably happens as they recollect all of these experiences. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll unpack that a little bit. One easy way to answer it is talk about IRB, right? Because there was an IRB process behind this and they had certain standards that we had to um, live up to. Um, obviously there's the consent process. Um, and um, part of our articulation of the ethics of this was, um, you know, they're opting in to voluntarily tell their stories here, you know. Um, we have, our sampling was primarily more like a snowball method. Um, there wasn't random sampling. It was really clear what the topic of the interview was going to be. If you've experienced sexual harassment, we'd love to hear your story. Um, we framed it in that, um, you know, it was centering around the Me Too movement. And um, I think a lot of people wanted to be able to tell their story, but do it in a place that, in a space that they felt like was safer than putting it on social media or telling a journalist or something like that. So I think that a lot of the people that we spoke with actually really wanted to tell their story. Um, so this voluntary aspect, I think dealt in part with, um, you know, it was their choice to want to recount this story. Um, from the IRB perspective, th there were two things, the consent form, obviously, um, but also we were mandated to provide um, trauma resources after the interview, um, just, you know, in case it was, it was triggering in any way. Um, one of the things that I did at the beginning of all of the interviews was to say, this is a really tough topic to talk about. Um, as with all qualitative research, we say, you know, you can stop at any time. You're not obligated to continue, right? But I made that really, really clear from the beginning of the interview. Um, I think there were some really interesting things about doing the interview process itself. The prompt was basically we just wanna hear your story the way that you wanna tell your story. I might ask some questions for clarity along the way, but um, don't take them as assumptions. It's just some research questions that we're trying to answer 
Um, and I did that in part because I found myself asking questions like that were sort of leading, like, did you tell anyone after this happened as if I was expecting them to have told someone? Um, when that wasn't the case, I just wanted to know for research purposes, did you talk to anyone about this, right? Um, so there is there is that that aspect of it. Um, I think the interviews themselves, um, it was the emotional aspect of it. For some of these, it was really really tough. Some of these people that were that I interviewed would cry during the interviews, and as an interviewer, being trained in qualitative methods, you're stance, your immediate reaction is, you know, I'm going to remain professional, I'm going to not cry, <laughs> you know, I'm going to, but then for on like a feminist side, that's actually embraced for, for me to be able to um, reciprocate with those same sort of emotions. And I would say, especially as I got further into the interviews, I let go of my research persona role and just tried to be a person that they were talking to. Um, and there were definitely times, you know, that I cried. Um, and that even gets into a related question, which um, I'm glad to be have been doing this research with a partner because there were times that I'd have to call, you know, um, Megan after an interview and say, I just need to debrief. You know, there's a little bit of vicarious trauma happening here. Um, and so, and I would write, you know, research memos or other things to kind of um, process those emotions. But I do, apologize not for, for putting any sort of trigger warning. I really probably should have. We've been doing that mostly in the presentations that we've been giving on this topic. Um, and even in one of the book chapters that I've written um, on this, I give a trigger warning um, prior to getting into it. So I apologize for that. I should have, I should have done that. I appreciate that question. And also, Erin, Dr. Beaton, your response in terms of the complexities of the role of researcher participant looks different in a post-positivist or positive study versus you, the approach that you shared and that you come from and, and that connection and the humanity of being a researcher. And, and your point about IRB do no harm, it means so much more than the requirements for IRB. And so as a researcher, I, I appreciate how you're really looking at your decisions matter and the humanity of the research before, during, after with participants or co-conspirators or, uh, or co-participants or uh, um, informants, you know, whatever language you're using also reflects the approach that you're taking and the complexities there. So I just, um, I appreciate you're talking about what that means as a researcher, just beyond what the IRB requirements are. Um, what, what other questions do you have or conversations? Cause it's a small group. It's kind of nice to be able to have these conversations. So I have a question for you, Dr. Beaton. Um, so as someone who studies how organizations create structure inequality, right, inequity, looking at the uh, study that you shared with us, how would you advise someone who was in a situation like that to address that issue rather than, you know, self-policing things of that nature? That's a tough question, right? And this is something that critical scholars get um, chastised for is critiquing without providing solutions. Um, we're masters of critique and, and, um, and uh, not always as good about providing solutions. And so um, I mentioned that part of this process is giving a restory, right? Um, and every restory I've given to Liz has not felt adequate. Um, I, no matter what I do, it just doesn't feel like it's good enough. Um, and so I think that that the question you ask is very, very is very tough. Um, what I one way I could answer it is to talk a little bit more about thinking about these issues from a particular research tradition. Um, because what post-structural feminist theory would tell us 
is that, um, that power is everywhere, that it doesn't go away, that um, people don't hold power, that it moves through relationships and connections in sort of a capillary um, sort of way. Um, so it's not possible to just remove the patriarchy, for example. Um, there are ways to resituate power and to reconstitute power, but you can't just remove power from situations. It will always be there. So the, um, the answer becomes from a Foucauldian standpoint, becomes that there's always going to be social arrangements that are inequitable. Um, but they can shift. And if you want them to shift, part of that is changing the discourse. Um, and it begins with changing language. So, um, so the words that you use really matters. Um, so I do think that from a post-structural feminist standpoint, there's probably uh, something to be said for the words that are used to describe the experience perhaps the words that are used back to the congressman, um, but not uh, without forgetting that this is a structural issue. Um, so it becomes pretty, pretty complicated. Um, really the restory I wanna write for Liz is the one that I would want, which is a big F you to his face. <laughs> Um, but I don't know if that's going to be acceptable in the academic literature as a restory, right? Um, so yeah, I've been playing with a lot of ideas, um, and I'd be so interested in hearing other ideas. It sounds like there's there's some folks here that you know, kind of, this experience kind of resonates, right? Like, what is the right sort of not that there's a right response, but what are some responses that would um, would push back or resist against that power in a way that could be productive and or feel more emancipatory than maybe um, silence. I've been wondering about a solution that's maybe more like, um, I'm not a comedian of any sort, but maybe sort of like a joke back to the congressman, like, and you're looking really great today too. Um, you know, like maybe that would like turn the tables a little bit and help him understand how ridiculous it is that he's commenting on her appearance when he can't even see her. I don't know. But yeah, like I said, I'd love to hear any other ideas if, if you have them. You mentioned joking, which is not my style, but my girlfriend, uh, I, she was in my uh, cohort, but in front of me, she would say, could you say that again in the microphone, please? And, you know, whoa, and, you know, but the humor was a way and that person knew it as soon as she said it and it stopped it, but kind of allowed him to, well, I don't know about save face, but it was somebody with power, a faculty who was um, over her, but anyway. That was right, the goal of emancipation. Well, I don't know. I guess that's a fundamental underlying question. Is the goal of emancipation just to feel like you stuck it to him and then it doesn't really matter what happens to you after that if you lose your job or whatever else? Or do you have to simultaneously sort of like keep your standing and respect while also resisting? Um, maybe that's a matter of personal preference and I'd have to ask Liz what hers would be. I don't know. <laughs> Michaela also mentioned, do you look better when I don't wear my glasses, Congressman? I <laughs> love that. There's I think that's hilarious. also a comment from Angela, which relates to what you're saying now that she had mentioned earlier in the chat. I know I'm just not able to turn on and off her mic, but um, thank you for still adding this. Um, she earlier said, I think I have another opportunity for her. I think having the participant have another opportunity to review is a good idea. Um, otherwise, I feel I may draw inaccurate portrayals. And I know you've already spoke to multiple portrayals. And, um, you know, uh, this is something I would need to practice and refine as a researcher implementing constructing techniques and then you just brought up asking the participant again this and I thought it might connect to the earlier question comment and if you wanted to kind of speak to some of that 
Yeah, I think it's, I've thought quite a few times about reaching back out to this research participant. My colleague, um, Megan, was the one that had interviewed her um, and she really only signed up for one interview, you know, and I've chosen it because I think it's a very, I don't, stereotypical, I guess, example of sexual harassment, like what typically happens or maybe what we typically think of as sexual harassment. So I pulled it out from all of our interviews as an example, but um, I, ha I, I should really do that, reach back out and just, just test the waters to see if she'd be willing to re-engage. And um, I just also don't wanna, we, we're all so busy, right? Especially, I don't know, I as a mom, you know, resent things that take up my time that I don't wanna spend my time on, right? And so I wouldn't want her to feel um, pressure to take more time towards something that, um, that is really about, hopefully making a difference in the world, but also pursuing my career and publishing something, right? So um, I've taken a lot of pains to also um, try to um, anonymize and take out a lot of the details and things. Um, I, I'd like to reach out to her just to also make sure that she feels comfortable with the extent to which I've um, done that, or if maybe I could share a little bit more information about the contextual situation, which I think is relevant. Um, so, and it was my mistake. Somebody else said they couldn't unmute, but I, um, so Angela, please unmute if you'd like, or, you know, I just saw it in the chat and I know I wanted to make sure either way that it was, it was shared. Thank you so much. Yes. Ooh, Bakari, I'm going to let you go for this one. It's in the <laughs> Absolutely. So the question here, um, do you find there are contradictions in the philosophical traditions of feminism and post-structuralism or within feminist post-structuralism, right? So this is a bit of a handful here, right? But, you know, we're sure you're going to knock it out the park. So if so, how do you <laughs> reconcile or manage these contradictions? One example may be removing hierarchy as a feminist practice in the interview, but also recognizing power. Is there is there and not removable. So we're gonna lob it up to you and we expect you to do your King Griffey Jr. thing. <laughs> um, so I think that that, so first of all, that's an excellent question. And yes, there are, there are contradictions um, that have been noted by a lot of feminist scholars. Um, but surprisingly, I haven't ever heard this one come up and you make an excellent point about um, the removing of power and um, the ability to do that in the interview process. I'll have to think about that a little bit more, I think. That's not something that I've read as a critique, but one of the critiques that's a very big one, um, there, there are post-structural feminists that really subscribe to Foucauldian point of view. And there are some feminists that really push up against that perspective. Um, and in my reading, one of the biggest reasons is because um, Foucault's view of the subject um, and subjectivity is that there is that there is no essentializing that women as a category is not something that you can essentialize there isn't an essential woman there is no such thing as woman um, and so feminists that um, that are uh, really focused on activism and creating solidarity among women find that to be very problematic for their practice of organizing. If you can't use the subjectivity of women or an essential experience of being women to unite women against these structures, then how is there really any way to make any progress on these issues? Um, and so that's that's one of the big um, uh, tensions in my view between feminism and post-structuralism. And it actually speaks a little bit to the challenge of answering Bakari's question about what to do in this situation, right? If power can't go away. And it's, you know, it's a big critique of Foucault's work, really. Um, so yes, I think that there's definitely tensions there. Um, and you either put them out center stage and just say, here's how I'm dealing with them, or Put them in the background um but yeah i'll have to really think about that um interview practice and if there's what foucault would say about the ability to try to equalize power in that relationship 
you know, if others, you know, know some of Foucault's work or have some ideas about that, I, I'd love to hear. So I, I would ask one more one more question, right? Someone who is familiar with critical theory and in some of my writings, I've even promoted being critical of critical theory. Mm -hmm. um, but to talk about this issue of power and how it doesn't go away, it's simply transformed and so on and so forth. Um, but in your work, talking about post-structural feminism, is there a promotion of women gaining power as a way to almost um, protect themselves from the vicissitudes of being a woman in society in the workplace. Yeah, so I think that that speaks to the different strands of feminism that are out there. So some strands of feminism, um, radical feminism is a point of view that um, suggests it's really about women taking power or creating situations where they eliminate patriarchy, for example, by creating women's organizations um, and having their own spaces um, or by creating um, in a more liberal tradition, just representation of women in um, positions of power. So a post-structural feminist view um, suggests that, you know, that that's really not um, going to solve everything. And we see that too. If we think about the sexual harassment literature, um, we see that things get better for women in an organization when there are women in leadership. Um, there's less sexual harassment, but it doesn't get eliminated, right? Um, and so um, having greater representation, which is a form of taking more power, can be useful, but it's po impossible to eliminate. Um, in a post-structural sense, the, the goal is not for women to take over power. They talk about um, uh, what, uh, there's um, a couple, couple quotes and I forget the term that they use, but it's like destroying that sense of power, I think is the word that they use is about destroying power, um, which isn't maybe a hundred percent consistent with how Foucault talks about it because he talks about the inability to remove power from situations. Um, yeah, he, his writing is, is very dense and complicated to really like understand and it, it leaves you in a little bit of a bind at the end as to what do you do with all of this. If, if you're interested in a methodologist and a qualitative researcher who picks up Foucault a lot and the activist, aspect of being a researcher. Uh, Aaron Kuntz is somebody who has written The Responsible Methodologist, Inquiry, Truth-Telling, and Social Justice. And uh, he is a big post-structural Foucault. And um, actually in the work, uh, I know you talked about critical as really connected to post-structural and post-modern and the post. Um, and he pulls that apart in intentional ways and um so it just you know somebody else to dive into i also know you know as you've talked about um before a lot of people will critique holding on to you know here's another white guy who's talking about important things and where are the places where we could talk about like hooks with the imperialistic white supremacist capitalistic patriarchy and then think through and name um you know, feminists who are out there who have been all along doing feminist work that uh, is global in nature, local, depending on where you are in the globe with indigenous feminists and uh, Arab American feminists and, um, and feminists across the globe. And I think there's really important space for like this work you're doing, and I'm excited about early career scholars and you all taking a look at this and thinking about what you think um, and, and really um, addressing this. Because I think, um, Erin, your work is really exciting and important and needed to think about the critical and post-structural feminist and ways together in um, 
workplaces organizational theory, it's not always taken up. And I don't know if, um, I know we have time for like one more question, but does it feel dangerous to you as a pre-tenured faculty? Um, and I know some grad students are on the call or, or it, what kind of words or thoughts do you have for people who might be doing work that's not necessarily the norm that usually gets published? And um, if, I don't, if you have words of advice or thoughts for this group about doing work that's non-dominant work, I, I, we would welcome hearing about that. Such an important question. Um, so obviously it's something that I've grappled with quite a bit, especially coming from a critical program. It was really kind of ingrained in me to begin with. Um, and it is very hard to publish. And occasionally you get some critical work in a really big, um, you know, high impact outlet, but usually not. Um, and so it's definitely a, a consideration. And I think it's a personal uh, question that we need to all answer for ourselves as researchers about what's most important to us um, and, um, and to what degree you are willing to play the game. Um, to get to a certain place. Um, some people will say, you know, you just do mainstream research until you make tenure and then that's when you get to do, you know, the stuff that you really want to do. Um, and then there are others that will say, no, you know, that there's just, life is too short. You know, you, you can't just wait until you make tenure to do the stuff that you feel like is really important. Um, I think for me, the personal choice that I've made is to kind of split the difference um, and try to um, try to be in a middle space where I, so for example, some of this um, sexual harassment work was published in one of the top PA journals. It wasn't explicitly critical. We framed it as um, feminist but using more interpretivist methodology. So a combination of phenomenology and um, narrative inquiry. And so it allowed me to make what I think is a pretty critical, take a pretty critical view on this. Um, specifically, it was about, we're uh, interviewing fundraisers that are experiencing sexual harassment by donors, which tend to be, you know, wealthy white men, right? And the fundraisers are often younger women. Um, and so we wrote this paper about uh, how the, the women in fundraising are really being exploited, especially by some of their managers, encouraging them to dress more provocatively, things like that, um, in order to appeal to these donors. And so I was able to make that critique but do it from a position that felt like it could fit in one of the, the um, high impact journals. So that's one way that I've sort of split the difference. I've also done just more purely ethnographic type work and been able to get that in some of the, the top journals. I've done some quantitative work as well, which is not my favorite. I feel like it doesn't answer my questions, the questions that I think are really important, but I've done it. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's just a personal decision about how long you're willing to wait, how strongly you feel about certain issues um, and how long you're willing to wait to do that work. Um, and I feel like I've gotten a bit lucky to be able to at least start to make my way into more of that critical space. But I can tell you, I probably wouldn't have given a talk like this two or three years ago. Well, we're so lucky that you did then. Thank you so much. And um, and just thank you so much. I want to mention that uh, we're, we're very grateful for the work, the thinking, um, and also future Qualab lunches. We now have Transana. If you do video research, Transana is a way to really look at, and it, like in vivo, analyze the data you analyze it, but it's a tool for you. And then we have uh, future uh, sessions coming up after that. So please take a look at those and we hope you're there. But uh, again, thank you, Dr. Aaron Beaton for your important work. And it is encouraging us all to be 
risk takers and think about for ourselves what that means for us in different spaces. I'm somebody that believes it's needed in different forms, in different ways, in low risk, high risk, everywhere behind closed doors in front. So whatever your role is in taking that up as a scholar is important and the right way to do it. So thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming.